Tim, how are you? I'm doing really well. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good. What's that uh, background behind you there? Uh, that's just uh, that's wallpaper. That's just my house. <laughs> All right. Cool. Where are you physically? I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, were you part of the DevSecOps days a couple weeks ago? Uh, I wasn't able to make it, but I met up with some uh, sonotypers after after their uh, conference there. I heard it went very well. I got yeah, great. I, I heard great reviews as well. That's good. I think Rachel did a great job on that. Uh, when we're looking at what you're talking about, it says tools, not rules. So give us kind of an overview. What are you trying to get here? You know, it's uh, we're talking about the journey we've we've walked. Uh, I'm from American Express, and it's it's really it was so awesome to hear Edwin talk about similar things where we're we're talking about developer empowerment. We're talking about going from kind of draconian, ham-fisted rules to helpful tools, and hopefully uh, getting back to the root of DevOps, which was uh, making more software faster and better. It's interesting that you would pick up on that. You weren't here for the introduction, but Edwin is in the financial industry also. And I think financial industry is what's driving a lot of this stuff because if you're not fast and you're not doing it right, you can't compete anymore. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we certainly don't want to lose. <laughs> All right, if you will share your screen, yeah. I'll it over to you and I will be in the background. I'll share these slides and we can do this. I can see it. All right. Hopefully everybody can see that just fine. And I'm off and running. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Tools, not rules. I'm going to talk about the DevOps journey we've been on in American Express and some of the things we learned and some of the things we did uh, somewhat poorly uh, and, you know, uh, how we picked ourselves up and uh, kept going. First things first, they say always lead with uh, empathy and, and, and grace. So I'm going to say thanks to all the wonderful people at Sonotype for putting on this conference. This is a cool experience. Cool for me to be able to come out here and do this. Thanks to all the pe wonderful people who made this conference run smoothly and who have been so nice to me. It takes a ton of work to make these things happen, and uh, I don't want them to go unnoticed. These, these conferences are really, really fun to do, and uh, there's uh, it takes an army to make them work right. Uh, all the wonderful people who are my fellow speakers, there's been some awesome sessions already and there are more to come. It has been uh, enlightening to see all these great ideas. It's great to be a participant in this conference as well as a speaker, just hearing all these interesting things that are happening in the Sonotype community. And last but not least, attendees. Conferences are kind of uh, pointless without attendees. Thank you, the community, for coming together. Thank you for giving me time today to speak. and. Uh, tell you a little bit about what we've learned as we've uh, worked with this product. Uh, who am I? I'm Tim Cleaver. I uh, work at American Express. Uh, I am a developer by trade, which means I make things. I'm a craftsman. I take bits and bytes and I kind of glue them together and I make new things. Uh, development is my second career. If you saw me in the video very briefly, I still wear the uniform from my previous career, which was uh, an array of rock and heavy metal bands. Uh, touring the Southwest. After I got done with that, I moved into software development. I'm fanatical about automation and software testing. Uh, I was born in the back of a Nissan in Phoenix, Arizona. It is a sunny 111 degrees today here in Arizona, so any hotter in this broadcast would definitely be from my swimming pool. Uh, I hold the title of Scottish Lord. I hold a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I am one, let's call it, five millionth owner of the Green Bay Packers football team. And if you want to talk to me about any of those things, I am at Tim Cleaver on Twitter. I give you this slide as some fun facts about me. But also, uh, if we get to the end of this presentation and you say to yourself, oh, my gosh, that guy was a nut, uh, this was your warning. This was the slide that you should have uh, picked up on that. So what are we going to talk about today? We are on a journey. We are always trying to improve DevOps, trying to make things safer, trying to make things better for our company, for our customers, trying to make our developers more effective, trying to make them happier, uh, trying to make things easier to do. And uh, that is a journey that never ends. That is a journey that has not stopped. These are notes I've picked up along the way. Perhaps you've run into similar situations. Perhaps you haven't. Maybe I can help you. I'm going to talk about some tragic failures, and then I'm going to talk about how we've turned it around. But what I want to make clear is this journey is not over. I don't have a beautiful ending uh, to this. There is no nirvana that we've reached. 
And then I can say, yep, that's exactly how you do it. And if you do it like that, it'll all work out okay. I don't have that advice. All I have is uh, the scars of what we've done so far and the things that are working well right now. So the problem space. Uh, I mentioned previously I work at American Express. Uh, that is a 170-year-old financial services company. Uh, for context, just to quantify that 170 years, that means that American Express has been around since before the American Civil War. It is old. We started as a competitor to the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, we have invented cool things like traveler's checks and the plastic credit card that you presumably might have in your pocket or wallet. We also have a massive, massive catalog of software. It is a tremendous amount of software that we have from really, really neat, super innovative, cutting edge, NDA kind of stuff that I'm not even allowed to speak about to you know things like old bank software that you would complain about in the movie Office Space and everything in between, right? We have this enormous base of software and we need to make sure we're safe we need to make sure we're protected. We need to make sure that our customers get the service and reliability they expect. So in the beginning, these are the pre sonotype days. There were rules. We had big tomes of documentation. We had all these rules about what you could and couldn't do. And here's how you would bring in new software. It would come with a manual review and that manual review would go off to people like application security and it would go off to our lawyers and compliance. It would go off to IP rights to make sure we're not infringing on some kind of contract. It would go through all of these things. And again, as uh, uh, an audience who I know is passionate about automation, you know when you see the word manual, you know what it means. It means slow and expensive and full of friction. We weren't getting the ecosystem insights that we were looking for. We really struggled when we would have to make large changes. If we need to get a component out, it would be a very large effort. And while it could be done, we were looking for ways to do it better. Um, so we brought in a tool. We brought in, we brought in Nexus Lifecycle. We brought in Sonotype and Automation to the Rescue. Now we have a tool. Now we don't have these slow old ways. Now we don't have all these threads of people trying to get things together. And we fixed it, right? We fixed it. It's over. Uh, this will be the shortest presentation of the day. Uh, we brought in automation and everything was okay. And of course, by now, by the tone of my voice, you've probably come to realize that I'm being facetious. We brought it in, and we had about 2% coverage, less than, really, of our ecosystem was covered. We had almost zero organic adoption. So we had these great tools. We know we had the solution. We could do this. We, we, we've got the automation. We don't have to do these manual reviews anymore. We don't have to feel that pain. This is great. Why does anybody want to do this? Why does anybody like this? And so we started asking ourselves some questions, right? We had, we had brought on these tools. Why isn't this working? Why are we failing? We have these great tools. We have these fantastic tools that do the thing we need, to, that solve the problem we need to solve. But the problem still persists. The problem still is here. What, how, how could we have boondoggled this so badly? And uh, it ended up being, you know, some interesting meetings, right? Shouting out in frustration, surely be it a sonotype tool or another tool, you have been in a meeting like this. And I want to key on these things because these are the meetings where you, these are the turning points. These are the moments when someone is shouting exasperatedly, well, we've done all we can. We've got the tools. What, what, more, what more do they want? There's no way we can do anything more. This one, I think we've all heard about a thousand times if we've, uh, been around the block a few times. Oh, those developers, they never care about security. They just want to use the shiny new JavaScript framework and run away. Those developers, darn them, and then maybe some curse words follow up, right? Or something like this, even a little less insidious. Security is everyone's job. Why aren't they doing it? Why aren't they playing their part? Why aren't they helping? And of course, I throw these up because these are the kinds of frustrated exasperations where we knew we were doing it wrong. When we started having conversations like these, we knew we were going down the right path. We knew that these are not the way to the way we want to be. And so we had to step back. We had to retro. We had brought in these tools and we weren't getting the results we wanted. So we needed to get somewhere. We were doing what we call laissez-faire DevOps. 
something where we say we brought the tools and we can just kind of like pass them off to other people and say, hey, you've got what you need now. Go ahead. You should be secure. Why aren't you secure? How come we're not secure yet? What is this? We had fundamentally kind of forgotten the idea of DevOps, which is partnership and togetherness and community and bringing all these things together. We were doing it in a very kind of wedge way where we said like, uh, where we were being a block, not, not a bridge. We were being a wall. And so we retroed. What had we really done for them? Well, we had increased developer cognitive load. We had brought in a new tool for them. We had added a new thing to their build. We had brought a new consideration. You know, these now we have developers that are maybe reading CVE reports and remediation ideas for the first time. This is new stuff they have to learn, and we we hoisted it on them without them really asking. We had an unbalanced value uh, developer value proposition. This is something we keyed in very heavily on when we talked about how much we appreciate our developers, how innovative and smart and awesome they are. They're brilliant people. And if we believe they're brilliant people and we're confident that they're brilliant people and they're not doing the things we want them to be doing, then it tells us that they are making a choice. They are making a trade-off and we were left on the other side of that line. How do we get on the good side of the line? And then late discovery. Uh, as Edwin was just talking about, no one likes things being upset. No one likes a delivery date getting pushed. No one likes a build getting broken or a... Uh, deployment getting rolled back. No one likes to do that rework. We were giving them a new job. We were giving them more to do. We were not giving them help. We uh, we failed for the reason that I think almost any project or any company or any idea ends up failing. We failed to understand the needs of our customers. We failed to understand our developers. We failed to understand what they desired, what they needed, how this would work for them. Uh, when we talk about speed of delivery and we know the uh, industry statistics, like uh, that there's maybe 150-ish open source components per project in a corporate project. And we know that in our ecosystem, we have thousands and thousands of projects. We knew we had to move faster. We knew we had to move better. We knew we had to move at the speed they moved at. We knew we had to enable them to deliver for our customers. And we were slowing them down, so they cut us out. So we went back to the drawing board. Who should we be? What are we, what, why did we start this? Why did we bring in these great tools? What was the point of all this? Well, we, we thought we were going to save the day. And, and then now it looks like we've, we've missed the mark. What, where, what, let's go back to those original ideals. And we started with the original ideals of DevOps. That's the idea, the idea of bridging these things, the idea of, of bringing people together and being a bridge and building community, right? And a, a term you're going to hear today where you say, well, it's more than that these days. You can't just do the two things. you got to do more. And you're going to hear this one all the time today. Yeah, DevSecOps. Yeah, we're, we're security. We care about that. But, well, we, we don't really just care about security, right? We care about more than that. We care about compliance and licenses. So, okay, so maybe we're DevSec Comp Ops. That, that strikes me as a pretty fitting title. Maybe we can brand ourselves as that. But even that probably falls a little short because we're a regulated industry. We're financial services. We have auditors and governments to uh, appease. So maybe we're DevSec Comp Reg Ops because we, we're going to help developers get through their regula regulatory issues as well and you know that seemed a little so maybe we have to put the customer at the beginning of everything we do so maybe we're cus dev sec comp reg ops that's our new name but even that that left out this community feeling that we love so much so we decided we would be cus dev com sec comp reg ops and as you can see our title got long and ridiculous and foolish and we had to sum it down who should we be really we did down to service first and foremost. We went, set out to serve our colleagues and partner with them in, aid, in aiding in delivery. And when I say partner, I mean partner. I mean that their delivery is our delivery and that we're in it together. And then just because of my influence, I said we were going to have fun doing it. We were going to have a great time. But this is really where we turned around our our uh, open source compliance and enforcement world because we, we decided that it was our job to make sure that developers were continuing to be successful. Something that we kind of didn't explicitly state before. 
So that's good news. All right, we've turned a corner. Where do we go now? Some guiding ideals. Empowerment, not enforcement. Uh, this is an area where we're head up. We believe that an enforcement is a failure on our part. If we have to break a build, if we have to roll back a deployment, if we have to stop, uh, uh, if we have to pull something out of production, do a fast rollback, these are things that are super, super late discovery, and it means we fail to give someone the right information at the right time somewhere earlier in the chain. And while it's certainly okay to fail, we key in on these things so that we can do a good job of making sure that people have the right information to make the right choice so that in a perfect world, enforcement just goes away and because everyone's got everyone's on board. If everyone needs to do it, no one should do it. This really came up heavily for our regulatory and other kind of compliance level issues. If every developer is tasked with doing the same task, let's pull it off their board. Let's pull it off their board, automate it, get it out of their way, put it onto the side, and let them get back to the science of developing. Get them back to the science of delivering for our customers uh, something they're much more happy to do and something they're much more better to do. And this, uh, another one we just saw in the previous one is avoid blocking as much as possible. There will come a day where there's a critical security uh, vulnerability and we do have to push the big red button. We do have to stop the line, you know, papers flying off like an old time movie. But we need to avoid blocking as much as possible. How much of this stuff can we st stick into a backlog? How much of this stuff can we sh uh, shoot off to the side and allow developers to deal with as if it were technical debt? Allow them to deal with it on their schedule, in their sprints, how they feel like they should deal with it. So we went with these guiding ideals, and what did we do? We parallelized non-critical -crit security and license compliance. We pulled these off to the side and said, we're going to run a bill of material scans. We're going to do them all. We're going to find these things, but we're taking it out of your every day. Uh, if it's non-critical, we, we're going to log it as uh, technical debt, just as you would uh, a lack of code coverage or missing tests or static analysis issues, right? We're gonna put them in that pile and say, these things need to be seen, you need to know about them, they need to be cataloged, we need to know where we have hot spots. but at the end of the day, we're gonna allow the teams to figure these things out for themselves. The second point, if you take one thing away from this talk, it's the second point. This was the, by far and away, the largest win we got focused on building community uh, and feedback channels. We double, tripled, and quadrupled down on community, and it has paid dividends. It was truly the, uh, the best thing we've done. Uh, just as we are building community today here at uh, the Nexus User Conference, we built community internally where people come together, security professionals, developers, they, they talk about these things. They find migration paths. They find remediation paths. They, they work together. Everybody kind of communally making sure we can find a way forward. We're no longer in the business of telling people their, uh, their dependency is banned. We're no longer in the, the business of telling people their dependency is, needs to be removed. We've found a way to say, this is what we should do instead. This is a better way. This is how you can be safer. And by providing those alternatives, by providing that paved path, by providing the help, we've seen people uh, organically adopt it. And then finally, we've built a suite of tools backed by the incredible uh, things we get from Sonotype, their data, their tool sets, their APIs. We've built a suite of tools that delivers insights and answers to developers where they want it. Where are they congregating? Where are they communicating? Where do they talk to each other? How can we get in there? How can we be in their IDE when they need us? How can we be? How can we answer the question when they're pulling down their dependencies? When they're making a choice? All of these things uh, is an area where not only have we we been successful, but we want to go even deeper. We want to go even further on these things. How did it work out? Well, we talked at the beginning about how we brought in these tools. And uh, we had a coverage across our ecosystem of sub 2%. I mean, almost we almost didn't even register on the map. Now, uh, save for a few hotspots, we've got bill of materials coverage across nearly our entire ecosystem. We have data now that allows our security professionals to find problems and remediate them quicker. We have incredible data that we can give to our architects and our ecosystem teams. 
so they can look at what's going on and what developers are using and how they can use the better and where we can coalesce and where we can tool and make life even better. Uh, we've gone from, uh, again, less than 2% to almost complete coverage. And uh, as an organization, the data is amazing and we're uh, safer for it. Uh, this next one, again, I talk so much about community. Dependency and security compliance is now one of the largest and most active communities in the company. Picture that when we talk about those early meetings and we were, we were in a room and we were banging the table and we were frustrated and said, these, these devs, they just don't care. They don't care about security. They talk about security every day. We've had organic pockets of, of developers that have, have kind of really taken to this and they help out others. Now we've got devs helping devs, building a better world, building stronger software, delivering faster, delivering safer, delivering uh, solutions that have less and less and less. Because of this community that we've built, we've eliminated hundreds and hundreds of, of security vulnerabilities from our software suite. Uh, we're doing it. Uh, and then developers are getting the answers and insights and empower them to make the secure choice. If they have the right information, if it's available to them, it's in a consumable format, it's in the right place, they will nine times out of 10 make the right choice. And if they don't, then we can talk about them because there was probably some other factor that we haven't considered. These feedback channels really embedding, really sitting shoulder to shoulder with our developers and seeing why they make the choices they make, what pushed them to do what, doing postmortems, doing retros, really digging in for data uh, has helped us tremendously in figuring out the right way. And it can all be summed up by right now, our company is delivering more secure software with less friction from a collaborative, engaged community of technology professionals. How beautiful does that sentence feel? It feels tremendous. Uh, we're, our software is better, our people are happier, we're moving faster. All the benefits that they tell you on the DevOps slides, we are really beginning to see because we've built these communities and we've pivoted toward enablement. What did we learn? Great tools are not enough. Uh, great tools are awesome, but if you just kind of dump them out there and see what happens, that's not gonna, that's not gonna get you the results you want. De developer focused integrations, bringing it to them, putting it in the format they want. And again, that's a kind of a community, cultural, different for every company kind of thing. Where do they hang out? Where do they talk? Where are these discussions happening? How can we be in their planning meetings? Can we get it here? Can we get it there? Where can we put this data where they're gonna be most satisfied? And then the big one is that because of the success we've seen in community is that software development is rarely about coding computers. And I've put uh, a famous Peter Hinchins quote that you find in Zero MQ's guide, but the real physics of software is the physics of people, solving the largest problems in pieces. And that is the road we have walked. We had a large problem. We have a software suite, uh, we have a software uh, ecosystem that in, in book value is in the billions. It is, it is thousands and thousands of applications and components. And we, we had a very large problem to solve and we would have never been able to get as far as we have without people, without engaging, without uh, building community, without being right next to everybody and getting everybody on board on the idea. Where are we headed? Even deeper integration, more dev tools, more cool things, put this data in more places. Let's get new data, let's build on the data we have. Let's take these APIs and see what other kinds of things we can have. Can we combine these APIs with internal APIs and, and give, these, give our developers this really, really rich set of ways to make the right decisions at the right time so that they can plan accordingly and, and continue to deliver the safest uh, software for our customers. And then the third and most important thing, Let's go make whatever they tell us to want, right? Our job is to keep these feedback channels open, keep, keep listening to our developers, keep hearing what they need. How can we help them? How, how can we be of service? What can we build for you? What can we do to make your life easier? What frictions can we remove? If we stay on that path, I am confident that we will invent some really, really gnarly stuff as we continue down this journey. And with that, I thank you for attending my talk. Uh, I really appreciate you walking with that with me. It's been really fun. If you want to talk to me about uh, community building and using it to secure your software, reach out on Twitter. It's it's been a it's been a real pleasure. Tim, that was awesome. Hey, thanks. Really appreciate it. And, and I'm I say that in all seriousness. 
Um, you know, it's there's a couple things that I'd like to go a little deeper on because we got a couple more minutes. Sure. To go here. One is you said you had less than two percent coverage uh, of bill of materials. Now you're close to a hundred percent. We're getting what, real close. What it, what's the value of that? Why would a company consider doing that? And you can turn on your video so we can see you talking too. Oh, sure, sure. Let's see. So as you as you're turning that on, think about what's the value of having a bill of materials 100% coverage. You know where we've seen it. We've seen it in a couple places. Uh, one, uh, we've seen that if we know what we have, we can tool around them. Right? We can make choices going forward. Say, hey, what's what's popular? What are we using? Uh, we've used in 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 really abstract ways. We've used bill of materials to find out which open source projects are important to us as a company and that we can't, that are there, you know, you're looking for maybe sponsorship opportunities or we can't let this project go under. We, we depend on it to, to do our job. Um, we found uh, it's a security remediation is the obvious and biggest one. If a new, uh, if a new uh, vulnerability comes down the pipe, we know where it is. And even if we can't fix it, maybe through software, can we wrap these things in various security appliances or things like that. Can we quarantine them over here, put them in a special place? Can we remediate some other way? Can we build linters to see, um, you know, which ways we can uh, make use insecure software securely and things like that. None of that, none of that, none of that is possible without build materials. If you don't know where things are, you're just guessing. You're just throwing stuff everywhere, you know? You're on mute. Yeah, I got on mute when I talk. I keep forgetting to do that. You know, one of the things that uh, I'm high on, and obviously you are too, people that haven't done it yet don't understand the power of automation. And one of the things that you said is, if everybody's doing it, no one should be doing it. Yeah, yeah. We we really we try to we try to hold true to that as much as we can, right? Don't tell. Uh, everyone to add something to their build or say, hey, every project, we'd like you to do this. If, it, if you're using that every and all, you know, uh, and in cases where we have to deal with compliance or regulatory, it's very easy to quickly get into the, no, all, everyone. Then it's then it becomes our task to say, cool, then everyone just forget about it. We'll take it from here. That's great. The other thing that it reminded me of is I'm an old Perl programmer from way, way back. And Randall Schwartz used to say, you know, if you've done it twice, you've done it one too many times. That's absolutely <laughs> true. Uh, let's see. The final thing that I wrote in my notes for you is you're part of the financial industry, which is very heavily regulated. Uh, how are you finding automation helping to meet regulatory requirements? Uh, we uh, It allows us to do it faster without with without as much uh, hassle, really, uh, as we do a better job of cataloging this data, having this data usually for ourselves, and then when our regulators come along and ask us the various questions they ask us, the data is on hand. It's just oh, okay, print out the door, yeah. right? Whereas before we might have had people that just had to work on that for maybe uh, a month or so, gathering, finding it here in this pocket and that pocket, and assembling and grinding. So because we don't have because automation has allowed us to a monitor and make sure we're compliant quicker, faster, get rid of problems before they become real problems. Obviously, uh, the big the big key for us is always avoiding uh, ending up in front of a uh, you know like a congressional body or something like that where I have to explain why we leaked a bunch of records. Uh, we we never want that to occur. So you know, given that is our goal, we're we're getting these insights faster. We're solving problems quicker. We don't have to spend as much time chasing down data, and then we can spend our time doing cool things and making our customers happy. Well, it was certainly a pleasure. I haven't met you before, but that was a fascinating presentation, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, yeah, I'll be around. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Jump into the uh, track, uh, the track, the Slack channel. We'll do. Check for people and say hi, and they'll say thank you to you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.